Okay. Oh, that's Welcome everyone to the quarterfinals of the Winter Holiday Open. We're looking forward to an excellent debate between Team Denmark and DPS1. Let us welcome them. When one minute has elapsed, I will do that. When seven minutes has elapsed, I will do that. When eight minutes has elapsed, I will do that. At 8.15, I will do that and then probably glare at you, asking you to wrap it up fairly quickly. So uh, unless there is a question with no further ado, I'd like to invite the first speaker for the government to open the debate. Here, here. You don't get to decide where you are born. Whether you are born in a poor or a rich family, it's really not in your hands. Yet it impacts every single factor of your entire life. What, what school you go to, what people think of you, whether or not you live in a criminal society. Because we are the side that realizes that while you are born should not impact the rest of your life, that we should support those who are inherently disenfranchised, we're very proud to stand on side proposition. Today we bring you a three point case. Firstly, firstly about our principal justification, Secondly, about our benefits to the disenfranchised groups in society. And thirdly, about the just general societal benefits that uh, socialism will bring about. Okay, but before doing that, let's move into a model. So in a model we say that um, this, mo this house is defined as the whole world. Uh, we define socialism as socialist policies, like for example, redis re uh, heavy redistribution of wealth through uh, high progressive taxes, which means that the more, the more you earn, the more you pay in taxes. We also support a strong state uh, who, redis who redistributes uh, uh, like resources heavily to support those who are lower in society and take a bit from those who are high up in society. All right, and we say that our a perfect role model for this are the Scandinavian countries, um, where the government is a strong government that provides services for those who are the most disenfranchised within, security, uh, within society. Um, and for countries that, like Scandinavia, aren't able to have the funds to achieve all these measures, for them we should say that they should strive to, at some point, meet the, meet the standards of Scandinavian countries, for example. Okay, but with that covered, let's move straight into our points. Firstly, about our principle of justification. The thesis of this argument it is, is it that it is legitimate for governments to redistribute because privacy, to, because privacy is illegitimately earned through random factors. Um, Firstly, we'll tell you about uh, why, poverty, why private poverty is not inherently yours and why it's unjustly acquired. We say that, no thank you. We say that um, the wealthy people, the wealth that wealthy people have, have acquired is unjustly acquired. This is firstly uh, because of historical and societal um, and systems of oppression. We say that the reason why white people are so wealthy within society today is because historically they have been the group on top of society. They have abused those groups who are below them. They have been, no, thank you. They have abused lesser countries to be their workforce, to do the unfavorable jobs. Thus today, those people are less in society. And that even leads to a perception of them being less in society. Because historically, they haven't achieved much because the white people and those who are rich have dominated the world. Thus they've made achievements. And thus people think that disenfranchised and poor groups are lesser because they haven't done as much as those who, who, those who were historically wealthy. We say that this is just inherently unjustified because those who are inherently poor and unwealthy didn't get a chance to actually achieve anything in society because they were being so oppressed. Uh, so, uh, because of all these random factors, um, poor groups are poor because of events that poor groups that poor groups no thank you. We say that poor groups are poor because of events that happen that are out of their hands. We say that secondly, we see that we see uh, a lottery of birth. Really, you're randomly born into a rich family or a poor family. Now, this inherently is inherently important to, to to realize that whether you are born in a poor society such family uh, or rich society such family, that impacts every single factor of your life. It impacts like how wealthy your parents are, how much, how many opportunities they're able to provide to you, how much they're able to learn to help you in your educational system. No, thank you. What neighborhood you live in, how many opportunities you have, what people think of you, whether you are in a criminal society. It impacts literally almost every single factor of your life. Um, we think that um, thus you are inherently not um, the owner of your property because the reason why you make it far in society um, is not it, it's not just because of 
as of something you acquire, it is because of predetermined factors you were sent into that allows you to aspire and climb in society. We say that even the skills you are no thank you. We say that even the skills you acquire from birth are not inherently yours. Just because you're just because you're born with a high IQ doesn't mean you should have more uh, doesn't mean you should have uh, more benefits than those who were inherently born with a lower IQ or mental disabilities. All right, or at least uh, grossly higher than mental disabilities. Okay. Um, So, uh, we say that, uh, further about this, that about how measures are acquired through legitimate means, we say that how much you work in status quo really doesn't equal um, how, how much money you earn. Because we say today that even though we work really hard, even though we work really hard to achieve something, because of the skill, because of the skills you have from birth, because of the opportunity you have from birth, even though you work like 42 hours, uh, 42 hours every, uh, 42, 50 hours every week, you won't earn as much money as those, as those who have really rich parents who give them a really good education, who only work like 30 hours, but make millions of dollars. But really, how much effort you put into your work, how much effort you put into what you do every day, doesn't equal how much money you earn. So that's, we think that is inherently unjustified. Um, all right, and now, let in, secondly, in this point, uh, sub point, uh, is let's just uh, talk about the role of the government. We say that the role of the state is to protect our population and uphold their basic rights. Uh, with more funds, it can, it can more adequately do this, it can actually do this, it can actually support the poor who don't have access uh, to basic rights. Uh, we say that the role of the state is also to, to benefit the majority of society, no thank you, and we say through socialism we're able to do this. Um, we say that we can also force people to, to pay for some things, like for example healthcare, uh, roads, uh, education, because these things are inherently just beneficial to them. It would be detrimental for them to not make these choices, thus the state can make them to actually make, force them to actually make, make these choices. Now let's move into our second point, is about, which is about the benefits to vulnerable members of society. Um, so firstly let's talk, just talk about the concept of utilitarianism. We say that the money is just inherently better spent in the hands of the poor than it is in the hands of the rich. Let's take the example of looking at $50. What can $50 do in the hands of a rich person? A rich person has $50, he then goes out to look, buy luxury items like, for example, expensive foods and new dress. Like uh, yeah, sure, I'll take a few. Well, speaker, but does, does the speaker not understand that what you're speaking essentially is the values of communism? But socialism is when all the resources are in the hands of the government. Will you speak on the lines of that as well? We say that resources are distributed to the to the government so that they are more so distributed to the government so that they, they can redistribute it out to the rest of society. It's not that the government keeps the resources, uh, they redistribute the resources out into society in a way that is just and fair and helps the poor groups in society. Uh, we say that that's not communism inherently. Um, communism is more extreme. Um, all right. Uh, so what I was saying is that. Uh, we say that with, with, uh, a rich person with fifty dollars can buy like luxury items or earn up to a new Lamborghini, even though they already have a car. Well, fifty fifty dollars in the hands of a poor person, they can buy stuff that is, that is necessary to survive, stuff that is, that are basic human rights, a roof over their head, the next meal that are currently uncertain about, and maybe get their kids in, even get their kids into education. We say inherently this results in more happiness and thus more utilitarianism. Thus the money should go to those people, and thus the money should be taken away from the richer people because we say it's okay that the richer people feel the most severe harms because they're already really well off and it won't necessarily hurt them that much. Only like a small degree of happiness and luxury items. Okay, we say that uh, socialism is inherently good for minority groups. Uh, we, we, let's just quickly bring out that minority groups are inherently uh, poor right now because of stuff that was out of their hands, right? Uh, it's like the way the system is right now is that rich people are stereotyped that they've been laid upon them because, okay, they haven't achieved too much, but really they didn't have a chance to achieve too much, right? So that they're, they're stereotyped, they're prejudiced about them that make them so they can't make it far in the job market. Thus, they are inherently poor. That we benefit them is inherently results in more benefits for them and happiness. Like, for example, they're able to reclaim their spot in society, they're able to reclaim, uh, they're able to take their effect, those princesses and stereotypes, and thus be more favored within society. So, we say that it's important to cater minorities because inherently they're minorities, they cannot represent themselves, and it's important that the government tell people they need to care about minorities because they cannot represent themselves, the government needs to do it. And because we have the minorities, because we realize the importance of socialism for society, we're very proud to stay in the past Speaker, please stop for eight minutes and 23 
speak with those remarks, we'd now like to invite the leader of the opposition party to begin the debate with their side. You're here. So what did Team Proposition tell us in today's debate? They told us equality needs to be achieved. These poor sections of society need to be uplifted. However, we do concede to that fact on side opposition. We do stand for the same lines. However, on side proposition, what they had to tell us was how exactly by socialism are they going to prevent the government abuses? How exactly by socialism are they going to achieve that? Because this world is not perfect. Each and every government is not the Scandinavian government. And that's why we're proud to oppose and are against the socialism. So I mean, what do we stand for, right? For, uh, for uh, on-site opposition, firstly, we stand for the uh, whole principle of modern, econ modern economic theory. We believe in controlled capitalism. Second point, we do uh, concede to the fact that equality is necessary, right? That these minorities need to be uplifted. However, we believe socialism is not the best tool of doing so. So I think the first week of team opposition is first going to rebut the points of my first week of team proposition and then put on my own points. That is, first, telling you the theory of modern economic, telling you modern economic theory, and second, about the political aspects of doing so. The second speaker of our team will first rebut the points of my first and second week of team proposition and will put on his own point. That is, the practicality of socialism and how exactly it does not achieve its goals. And the third speaker of our team will rebut all the points of my team proposition and some about the team's case. But before I move on, we need to make the distinction between socialism and communism clear, right? There is a very thin line between it, but we still need to make clear. As the proposition suggests that socialism, a communism, is extreme socialism. So we need to understand the difference. We see in socialism, the, all the resources, including the industries, including the transport, and all the resources are controlled by the government, and the government provides the basic needs to the people. However, what is communism? Communism is when the government takes all the resources and there is massive redistribution of the resources. That is communism. So we see that the proposition stands for communism and not exactly socialism. Okay, let's just assume that at the end of the day they do stand for socialism. But as they support it on a global level, we say at the end of the day, it is going to lead to extreme socialism. Okay. And as they themselves agree to the fact that so extreme socialism is communism, it is going to lead to communism. So how exactly is communism bad? That I'll be explaining in my speech, but before that, yes ma'am. Okay, so if you want to protect like uh, the poor in society, what alternatives do you propose? To Thank you. Reason? That will also be dealt in my speech. But we don't believe that through your prop uh, through propositions case we see any poor being benefited in the sense that each and every government is not the Scandinavian government. It is not corruption free and it is not loophole free. And also that socialism is not based on such principles. We believe socialism does not necessarily uh, give equality, rather it cuts down the innovation and the right uh, and the vigor to work. So let's move on. They also talked about how uh, a 40 to 50 year, uh, 40 to 50 hours of work is gonna earn less than 30, to, uh, 30 hours of work in today's world. However, we believe that the efficiency and the production where that work does matters. However, on-site proposition, at the end of the day, even if this doesn't happen, even on-site proposition, a 16 to 70 hour work is going to pay same as a 10 to 20 hour work, or even on-site proposition. So how exactly did they achieve that equality of wages which team proposition was being, uh, was being focusing on? Moreover, how, uh, moreover, they talk about how this will benefit the society and force people to, and they force people to pay for some resources. First of all, we see that this is not going to benefit for the society. That will be further being that in my own speech. However, uh, in my constructive case. So let's move on to my constructive case that is the political fact and the modern economic theory. So what do we mean by modern economic theory? We believe that the modern economic theory is the better part of socialism and will help in achieving equality. What does it say? We see that the basic resources or the uh, un uncompletable resources such as the uh, security, such as free transport, such as food, etc. needs to be given to the government. 
However, the markets and industries needs to be kept with the people. The main burden on side proposition is to prove that how exactly they'll give us efficient distribution of such industries, right? Team proposition needs to tell us that how this hierarchy of power which exists in society will no way influence this distribution of resources and industries and that is the burden on side proposition where they cannot actually achieve equality in resources which they have been standing for, right? But however, on the modern economic theory, we believe that innovation is necessary. However, on side proposition, we kill any part of innovation by giving people equal or equal wages in the sense that a person doing more work will get, get the same as a person doing less work. So at the end of the day, there's no incentive of doing more work or there's no incentive of innovation. So the innovation itself is killed down on side proposition. So why is innovation so important, right? Innovation is important for the growth of the uh, society. Innovation is the one which helps these poor sections of society to come up. When these poor sections of the society are given opportunity in free markets, when these poor sections of society are given at least a try on these industries, are given jobs which may pay more, we see that they can achieve equality. However, in our side, we at least do achieve, we at least make an effort to achieve equality. However, on side, uh, on side proposition, what we see is systemic abuse by the government resources and the uh, systemic abuse by the powerful ones. Yes, sir. Realize that contributing to society, working, creating innovation is inherently important to your feeling of self-worth. Thank you, sir. We believe the feeling of self-worth does not come with work. In today's world, who wants to work? The, even the judges don't want to work. Even I don't want to work. What, what's important, what's satisfactory for me sir. is the money which I get, right? That is the sir. main motive of satisfaction. The money which I get is the satisfaction. And in three proposition, when you just give each and every person the same amount of resources, the same amount of money, Money, no person will actually want to work, no person will actually want to come for innovation and the whole self-worth part which the proposition was focusing on is killed. Moreover, let's talk about how this will lead to political abuses. So we know that each and every government is not the Scandinavian government, is not the most important, uh, most powerful government and is not without loopholes. We have seen in most of the governments that this leads to just abuse of resources by the government officials and more distribution of resources to the ones who have been nearer to the government officials who have political influence so that they can come in the term again. So why exactly does this happen? So we see that this government abuse occurs because of this greed of resources. As I've already told you that satisfaction occurs on the money, right? If you have more money, you have more satisfaction, right? If you work for just a 10 hour job and you get a lot of money, then you will be satisfied at the end of the day. And it does not come with so-called work ethics or innovation on side propositions. So moreover, we see that this systemic abuse of the governments will occur. So what the proposition has to do is to tell us why exactly the most autocratic governments will not take most of the resources of these people, impoverishing people, and leaving very less amount of resources to be redistributed among the poorer sections of the society. And that's why, if you support the rights of these poorer sections of society, if you actually want to achieve equality in this paradigm, and if you want innovation and development, you should side opposition. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks. We'd now like to invite the second speaker for the government, Mr. Debate.
do panel as a mother with a, with a, with a difficulty with her family she's been born with is not able to work. Her kids are systematically disenfranchised in their pursuit of happiness and the pursuit to contribute to the society that they live within. This is the group that we think is most important. This is a group that we are the only side that caters to. I'm very proud to be on proposition. I'm going to do a couple of things for you in my speech. First off, I'm going to be taking a look at what we said in this debate and what their responses were and how they then what they gave to you of points. And moving into our last and third point of construction material on our side, how we have overall good uh, implications for society because we unlock a workforce that we do not see on the other side of the house. First off, let's just take a look at some clarification, right? <coughs> because we really had some problems with the definitions that we made on socialism. Recognize, socialism and communism are late, right? We acknowledge this. But what we say is that the distinction that we're making is that, for example, we, are not, we don't think that all companies should be nationalized, right? That is a metric of communism. You have every company is nationalized and owned by the state, and you have everyone should be totally egalitarian, right? We think that this egalitarian is really important, and that is what we're fighting for. But in the end, we think that it is principle of socialism that they need to attack. They cannot just say, oh, you are supporting oppressive government, right? Instead of really right. taking right. off, thank you, what we're talking to you about egalitarian and people having rights of opportunity, equal rights of opportunity. What? No, no thank you. What my first speaker tell you, talk to you about in his speech, right? We, he gave you this idea of the lottery of birth. Recognize that this is the main part of what we're talking about. We unlock people that have been born within societies where their parents aren't rich. No, thank you. And they therefore don't have the ability, that they don't have money to educate, right? Recognize the owners of the house, this becomes a bad circle because you have the idea of political capital, right? Politicians are only going to cater to the regions that have that already have rich schools, where the kids already go like, to these schools. What we see is that we're able to minimize the gaps, the gap between different regions within society. And so every minority, every person has more voice and more to say in the political system on our side of the house. But what did we also talk to you about? We talked to you about how the idea that money matters more in the hands of poor people than they do in the hands of rich people, right? They really didn't care. They really didn't uh, talk to you about this, other than saying, oh, this is a bad thing because we think that you should not thank you. People stop working when they don't uh, think that they see a plus to this, right? Which I'm going to talk to later on. Recognize the characterization that they made of what we were endorsing was the combination between socialism and oppression. That is not what we're fighting for. We're telling you that the basic, pr no, thank you, basic principle of a high rate restriction of taxes that results in you not being dependent of where you were born, the status, no, thank you, of your parents, right? That is what we think is this point. They need to support these approved to us, no, thank you. Why is proportional proportionality more important than egalitarianism? Why should you always earn the proportion of what you work, right? We think that the large shoulders should bear the most in these societies, and that is what we're endorsing, because this is a way that we think that we eliminate uh, differences between different social classes. Before moving on, I'll take a few more. Okay, so you said that we want to, that you as the, uh, by adopting socialism want to give equal rights to opportunities, but how will you be able to do that when there's no opportunities at all because everybody is in an equal stand and there's no development? Okay, recognize that for this to be true, we need to have no development at all. We don't think that this is true. This is a, a question about the degree of uh, like equal equality that we're talking about. We think that the people who work a lot, who give a lot to societies, should be able to have profit and see that in, in the, uh, the ability and the work they put into this. What we do not endorse is that you should always just make more money because you've been born into a family that could buy you an education. So you could go into a, thank you, a company where you could work for less hours than a cleaning lady but still earn more, right? We think that that's fundamentally unfair. They really don't, uh, they really don't challenge this what? idea. We must think that they agree to that then in the end. Right. Now, it, okay, so what did they tell you about? They talked to you about this whole idea of innovation, right? Of why this is going to stop on our side of the house. I'll come with responses to this. First off, we think that people, this is not likely to happen because people are interested in giving back to the state that they live in, right? They feel that they have a responsibility. No, thank you. Secondly, we think that we, have, we unlock a new group of innovators, right? Because we think that there's a group of people who are never educated on their side of the house, who can never go into like schools and become parts of the innovative society, right? We unlock these people on our side of the house. Lastly, they're talking about corruption, right? Two responses to this. On our side of the house, we can have measures to fight corruption. Because that is not a natural part of what we are advocating for. 
Secondly, we said that what we see on our side of the house is that people have more resources to inform themselves of the political situation of their country, right? So we think that there is less likely to be a, a position from the public if this sees this happens in society. No, thank you. Because people are in general more equal. Okay, moving into the last point of construction matter on our side of the house, the idea of how we unlock a workforce and thus contribute to the overall good of society. On our side of the house, because of this high level of progressive taxation, no matter if you are sick, if something has happened to you with the work, you can still be put back into the workforce, right? That's because according to their side of the house, if you're not able to work, that is because of your uh, dedication to your work. That is because of the amount of energy you put into it, right? The, fundamentally, these people get lost in the race of society, right? That doesn't happen on our side of the house because you're not froze in the situation where you can't buy medicine for yourself. This is good because of two things. First off, this benefits the economy. In the sense that we see more people are just working, contributing, you know, thank you to more people, just companies having more people that they can hire. Secondly, we talked to you about how the economy benefits from poor people spending money, right? This is the idea that when you are rich and you earn more, you go out and you spend, spend that money on car, car number four or a new fur, right? These are sectors that don't develop as much as the, the idea of everyone needing to buy a toothbrush, everyone needing clothes, everyone needing food. No, thank you. Last, secondly on this, we think that this has great psychological impacts. The number one cause of people being depressed is that they aren't in the workforce, right? This is because this tells you that you don't have capabilities. No, thank you. You lose your, you lose your sense of being a part of something, right? On our side, you were able to realize your full potential. You were able to realize, okay, just because I was born into a disenfranchised family, I can still unlock my full potential, potential and contribute to the society. Now, why is this good for the rich as well? Because this benefits their companies. This benefits the companies of sectors that provide this. Right? We think that secondly, we'll, we're likely to see less criminality on our side. Right? Because people are going to be less angry towards the companies that disenfranchise them. Because they see that the city is inherently interested in giving them the same opportunities as other people. Secondly, in this argument, we're talking about right, why is that state invest investment is better than the investment that company makes. This is because states are inherently interested in long-term development, right? Because they want their people to be able to always contribute to the workforce. Why is that not true for companies? Companies are inherently uh, responsible by their shareholders, right? So they don't invest as much. They don't. They sack their workers because they need to show results right now. That is why GM went corrupt. Uh, because they, well, that's why GM went corrupt, right? Because they stopped <coughs> investing and had to show results to the shareholders right now. That, that's why they only focus on the bottom line. On our side of the house, we can have overall this. This is good because the state is inherently interested in receiving the indirect taxes of you being able to work and thus contribute to society as well. That is an essential uh, benefit that we have on our side of the house. In the end, we have all of us in Team Denmark are able to do this debating. We have families that are comfortable, our parents are teachers. We are able to do this because the state subsidizes the educational part of our government. That is the only reason we are here. Please don't make that a wrong thing in this debate. Thank you. Thank you. The speaker spoke for eight minutes and 19 seconds. Moving the debate right along, we'd now like to invite the next speaker to address us. Here, here. So 
let's talk about the kind of society we live in, right? Under their world. Because they tell us that because of lottery of birth, because of the fact that your identity is arbitrary, we completely neglect it. Because they tell us your identity does not matter because it is arbitrary. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Under their world, they're considered equal. You have no individuality under their side. You have no identity. Because they give us like very convincing stories, right? The same speaker comes up and tells us, imagine I'm a single mother. I cannot give food, I cannot give education. I cannot give food to my children. But under their paradigm itself, it does not matter if you're a single mother or just another man. Because under their side, they tell us, it is just arbitrary, right? That you're a single mother. Your entire identity under their case itself is unjustified because again, they tell us it's arbitrary. We believe this is the problem with their case. Because identity, what is the most important thing of one person's life, is undermined on their side. They tell you that you do not have the right to pursue your own development. They tell you even if you're a more, a more intelligent man, you do not have that right to pursue your own development because it is arbitrary. Because we believe this is the problem with the stance of proposition. They reject everything that is arbitrary. They have no moderation on their side whatsoever in principle or practicality. We believe this is where they have, uh, they have failed to prove, to prove to us why socialism in the end overcomes the harms that they cause on their side. Because first of all, it's going to the model itself, right? How they tell us we on their obvious proposition support progressive relaxation and how they're going to be this new property. They give you two problems with this, which they do not recognize. First of all, regarding the point of giving, like, you know, redistributing property. That is communism. What is communism? Communism is when property is owned by the community. That is why you redistribute the property to the community. You essentially change ownership from a particular group of people to the entire community. Please engage on that. Secondly, we tell you, we, and, and, and they need to tell us why it is like not the state that owns it, because that is the essential difference between, cap, between uh, socialism and communism. But we will continue to engage them on the principles which they bring up so often, right? Because then they come up and tell us that we're going to support progressive taxation. But then again, as opposition, we do not tell you that we're not going to overcome arbitrariness, right? We do recognize the fact that, you know, according to both, it is arbitrary. But we do not completely regret, we do not completely, like, regret it. Because they tell us that they're going to stand for progressive taxation. But we do not understand why they cannot come on our side. Because we can do that on our side. Because when we tell you progressive taxation exists, but how do you exist on their side when people don't even have private property? They tell us that private property is unjustified. So under their paradigm, there is no private property. There is no progressive taxation. We believe on our side, on the other hand, we can have progressive taxation. And we can have the other alternatives which they keep coming about. Because on our side, we stand for the modern economic theory. We tell you that there are some resources which need to be owned by the state. There are some resources for which only the government can work for the best interest of the people. But what do we tell you on the other hand? We also tell you in some cases for efficiency, for development of the entire society, we need to have, we need to like transfer some of this power to the people, but again under under the authority, under the control of the government. Like there is an unintended uh, unintended benefit, right? Because in uh, in uh, in markets that are like, oriented to preferences. Because this is what they neglect on their side. Because we'll give you because I'll right now give you an analysis as to what is necessary that there, like there's more markets are like, you know, very, very sensitive to consumer preferences, right? Because first of all, regarding this, they will tell us preferences don't matter because it's just arbitrary. Because even if like you like music more than food, we're going to give you equal amounts of it. It doesn't matter if you're a musician, because no, you'll get equal amount of music in your life as much as another person who does not even like music, who does not even enjoy it. So we think that is the first response that we have. But secondly, what is the problem with that thing you, right? Because governments, again, are not very sensitive to consumer preferences. They, first of all, again, I'll tell this to you in two cases, to the interest and ability. First, we tell you governments don't necessarily have the interest to work for the, for the betterment of the consumers. There is nothing like that on their side. They have to tell us why it is always necessary that the governments will work for the benefit of the people. We give you the example of Soviet, of Soviet Russia, right? Because when there was a war, the government decided that they would divert the state resources towards increasing spending on war, during increasing spending on ammunition, and thus there was constant food shortages, constant medicine shortages. So this is the problem on their side. Even if it is a quality, majority society is still left worse off on their side. We think, a second of all, the ability, right? Because governments do not have that incentive, first of all, that is profit. We think profit is a very important incentive which they fail to recognize in any way on their side, which I'll also be talking about later on. But then again, 
Are governments able to be sensitive to the needs of the people? We do not think so. We believe, on the other hand, when there is like a necessary competition, we believe there is a need to be on top of your other competitor. You need to be sensitive if you need to, if you need to stay in the market and if you need to make some form of benefit for yourself. We believe this is the way in which we do cater to the preferences of the consumers, and this is the way in which we create a better world. And Team Proposition again needs to uh, teach the classes on this. Then let's talk about the ideas which they tell us, right? Because then again, they need to tell us why exactly it is completely unjustified for any form of for any form in which like you have your own identity. Because we ask them a question, like does religion matter under their case? This is a burden that they have to tell us. Does religion matter? Because of video like a different atheists or religion. Like how do you make the difference? Who defines what is necessary for an individual, for a human? Because it's stripped them of their identity, we don't know what is the case. The governments are those who will decide it under their case. We believe that is is not, is, that is not a mechanism we would like to depend on. This is not a world we would like to live in. Because they tell us even IQ is arbitrary. We think that is a problem with that, right? Because my first speaker gives you the reason why people why people choose their budget is because they want to work for their own case. They like them, they want to develop themselves. Like first of all, people work not like mostly literally, most of the cases, it's not like that work has an inherent benefit to them. It's the money that provides them with the uh, provides them with the satisfaction, right? Because they can pursue happiness. Because the second speaker tells us how they help people pursue happiness because we give them the means to do it, because we give them money to do it. But how can they say that when they contradict their very stance in the first speaker's speech? When they tell us it does not matter about pursuit of happiness, it does not matter how much you work, but we're going to decide what your happiness is and we're going to force it on you. You do not have a choice in that case. We believe this is a very big contradiction on their side. And in the end, I'd like to say it is not a life worth living if they say, well, how is like equality, right? Oh, life is not worth living if you have no identity. It's not just about surviving. They need to tell us how they do more than that, how they make life worth living for the majority of the population. But we are able to do that when we bring a balance, when we strike a balance between, uh, between uh, markets and between the power that governments have and uh, which, that governments have. Last sense. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Which do you think are better? Average person being able to buy a Lamborghini or poor father being able to send his son to school? Again, so what did they themselves tell us the solution to this is progressive taxation. And we've already showed you progressive taxation this happened on site. Because we can tax the rich more, but in your case, when they have no private property, when you're essentially saying that all forms of private property are justified, how exactly will you carry out progressive taxation? We believe that is the one that you have placed on your side, and it needs to be made more clear by the first speaker of speech. So, and then this is the problem which they tell us, right? We need to understand that what is the basis of development? Because for development, we believe only development is what can benefit the overall good to society. They cannot just tell us that they help everyone when they already accept that no, we're going to harm development, we're going to harm efficiency. Because on their side, there is no proper utilization of resources. Because it needs to be made based on the consumer preferences. It needs to be made based. It needs to be made based on what people want. But team proposition tells us no, it does not matter. They tell us no, we do not care about development of the people. But just that everyone needs to be equal. But is the world better if everyone is? Equal? equal and poor, or is it a world better in the current scenario where if we make an effort to help the poor, but we still help all the people achieve their goals of self-development. We help all the people retain their identity, and we do not let opposition, if you do not want your identity to be stripped from you, we start with the opposition. Thank you. Eight minutes, nine seconds. Thank the speaker for those remarks.